Today we're in Philippians chapter 1, and I'll read verses 19 through 21 to you. Uh, we've been going several weeks now in this chapter of Philippians. Philippians 1 19, Paul says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my life, or in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We have looked at verses 20, 19 and 20 last week, uh, but... The, the verse that we'll really look at today is verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ. A lot of times people will quote that verse and they'll leave out two. They'll say, for me to live. You've heard people do that. It's for to me to live is Christ. And uh, the thing we want to look at behind all this today, what is life to you as a believer? Uh, Paul was a believer course, he's our apostle, and he's writing to the believers at Philippi. Uh, this is a prison epistle, and uh, what is life to, to you as a believer? And life's not easy for anybody. Uh, a lot of folks have a lot of different problems. You, you can go back the first time Rebecca and Isaac, you know, the children that had Jacob and Esau, and Genesis 27, 46, she said, I'm weary of my life. Weary of it. Rebecca said this. And a lot of people get weary of their lives. I'll give you another example we will turn to. Turn to Job chapter 7. Now Job, you, all of us know the story about Job and what Satan, God allowed Satan to do to him. Uh, and we'll look in Job chapter 7 and he starts talking in chapter 6. He continues on replying back to these friends in, verse, in, chapter, in chapter 7 as well. But chapter 7 and verse 7, Job says, Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall no more see good. Now there, there's, there's a lot to that there. Uh, my life there, oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall no more see good. And a lot of people get, once you get older, and even some, a lot of times you don't have to be old to have bad health. And your health goes and you have problems, and you'll say that I'll never see any more good days in my life. Uh, Paul's talking about this, oh remember that my life is when mine eyes shall no more see good. And also look in chapter 10, Job chapter 10 verse 1. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Notice he says, my soul is weary of my life. Uh, when you're weary, you're having the strength much exhausted by toil or violent exertion, tired, fatigue. Job's case, I mean, Satan, look what all he did to him. The situation that Job was in there, being weary, having the patience exhausted, or the mind yielding to discouragement. I mean, you, you get weary, you get your mind yielded to discouragement, and that's all you got on your mind. You know, look, look at me and look what I'm going through and life's so weary and, and you get discouraged. And you think about the toil. To, you know, toil, you think about one way to look at it is to labor. Another way is to look at it is to work out. But the toil, another way to look at it, is like a snare, like a trap. You think about a, a snare or a gin, the word gin there. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the cotton gin in this area. This area had a cotton gin years ago. Are any of you aware of that? It was in Charleston. And you, you can tell me, the cotton gin, they'd take the cotton in and it'd be gin, and it'd separate the seed from the cotton. Is that correct, Brother Ray? Yeah. That's what the cotton gin did. And it was located here in Charleston. I remember folks years ago picking cotton, and they'd take that to the cotton gin here in Charleston. So that, that tells you how old some of us are. 
by remembering that, but that was there for a long time. So the cotton gin separated the seed from the cotton, and it's a gin, it's just like the, it's a catch or a trap. And you think about Job there, my soul, he said, my soul is weary of my life there. I mean, he's just like the toil, he's exhausted by the toil, and it's like he, he's in a trap and all that. And he, he's thinking about all that. And, you know, you think about us as believers in this dispensation of grace. You know, Paul tells us something about uh, life. Go to Romans chapter 8 for just a second. Sometimes we have to renew our minds. Uh, we, have to, we have to realize that life is not going to be perfect. Life is made up, all of you know, as choices. Each day we have to make choices. And once you learn the grace life, you learn what grace is, and you live by grace, you have responsibility each day. And all of us know that, that we have, we have to take responsibility. But we are going to get sick, and uh, life, uh, a lot of times you get weary. But remember the Scriptures. Paul says in verse, Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If we can get that in our mind, for I reckon, when you reckon something, you know it to be true. So I know this. I can say, for I reckon. I, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And that glory, you're going to get a glorified body. And so what we're going through today is not worthy to be compared to what we're going to have. But you can reckon, you can count it to be true, to be so, you're going to go through some suffering. You're going to have physical problems. And, and life may be seem weary to you, and you may, you may get discouraged and all that. And that's why you need to renew your mind in the Word of God and realize that heaven is far greater and far better than what we can ever imagine or think. And our home's going to be up there one day in those heavens. We're heavenly people, so the discouragement, we shouldn't, uh, by reading the Word of God, we shouldn't allow ourselves to get discouraged because of that. You're going to have, you're going to have things. And doctors are not always going to under, uh, understand what to, to do or how to do or how to correct the problem that you have. But understand that we've got a better place than what this life is. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 Turn to this. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. This is how Paul handled situations, difficulties, what it, would it be health-wise or whatever. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect, in weakness. Most Paul, here's Paul's response. Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now that's very important there. For that reason, verse 10, therefore, means for that reason, I take pleasure in infirmities. Infirmities is sickness. He takes pleasure in it, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. That's why he can do that. It's for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I mean, that says it all. And all you have to do is read the verses, believe what you read, and get assurance in those verses and the confidence <coughs> and our, our hopes in the Word. In the, the, we've got the blessed hope of looking for the Lord to come. But understanding life is not <clears throat> always going to be pleasant. You're going to have sicknesses, you're going to have difficulties, and all these type things. But remember, the strength, it's Christ. Paul said, Christ is my life. And that's who Paul was living for. So saying all that, going back to the cotton gin a while ago, that word gin, you know, it's like a trap. It was a trap to separate the seed from the cotton and all that. But this is what Satan wants to do. He wants us 
in our life to trap us as believers. He wants you to fall into that gem. He wants you to not be uh, effective when your life is living based on who you are in Christ. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7, you think about the, the snare of life, the toil, to toil, the, to, it's a, the, a snare or a gin. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Moreover, 1 Timothy 3 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, he's talking about verse 1 there. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desireth a good work. And he goes on down through there. He's talking about in the snare of the devil. I mean, uh, uh, anybody that preaches the word of God has got to be concerned and watch and not fall into, into a snare of the devil. He's got those out there to far pastors. He's got them out there for deacons. He has them out there for you as well. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. Here's a note. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. This involves money. And this is something that, that the devil uses against believers. And not only believers, but lost people as well. But 1 Timothy 6 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. There it is. There's a snare there. And to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So there's there's a you know snare there. We talked about the bishop, but you look at everyday life, people that want to make money and want to be rich, then the concern is that they'll fall into a snare. And the devil has those out there. And here's one more, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 35. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 and verse 25. 2.25. I said 3. 2 Timothy 2.25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Do you know a believer can you can oppose yourself? Paul says you can. If God peradventure will give them repentance. To the acknowledging of the truth. How, how can we oppose ourselves as believers? Well, we can live opposite of who we are in Christ. We can allow the wrong doctrine to get inside of us, in our inner man, and, and we can oppose ourselves. Here we are, we're in Christ, we're saints, but we can live opposite of who we are in Christ. We can oppose ourselves. And a lot of folks do that. Verse 26 and that they may recover. How does, a, how does a believer that opposes themselves and they fall into the snare and the trap, how do they oppose them? How do they get out of it? And, they that, that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. The devil puts the snare, the trap there for believers. And they oppose themselves. They fall into those snares and traps. And they get down into that. And how do you get, up, how do you get out of those? Well, and, and that they may recover themselves out of it. You've got to recover yourself. How are you going to do that? The Word of God is going to help you do it. That's the only way you can do it. And who are taken captive by Him at His will. So, that's important there to understand there that the, the snares are out there. They're out there for bishops. They're out there for anyone that's going to, wants to be rich and have a lot of money and all that type thing. And there's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with having a good life and all that. But you have to watch how money is used or you'll fall into a snare and trap. Then you've got all of us, all of us as believers, if we don't watch, we'll oppose ourselves and we'll fall into that trap that Satan has laid out there for us. It could be wrong doctrine. And I, I talked to a man the other day. He was talking about, he's a great believer and about how doctrines are uh, being, how false doctrines are coming up every day. People have a tendency to go away from the faith. Well, what are they doing? They're opposing themselves when they do that. So I, I just want you to be aware of that, about life. We're talking about life. And we're talking about, you know, it, it could be weary. That's why you ought to put the 
Word in you, and your inner man now, while you're able to read and you're able to study, do all you can and put the Word in you. Then you, you think about Christ. Here's, uh, turn to John chapter 10, verse 17. John 10, 17. We're talking about uh, what is life to you as a believer. You're going to have problems. You're going to have, you're going to have sicknesses. You're going to have suffering. These type of things in life. You're going to have snares and traps laid out there. You've got to walk circumspectly and make sure that you don't fall into those. You don't want to oppose yourself. This type of thing. But Christ said in verse 17, John 10, 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, no that, that I might take it again. He lays it down. And we know by Him laying His life down that He did die for the sins of the world. That He died for us. And, and with that, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. About my, uh, Christ and His life. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. It talks about husbands now and your wives, but Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And you think about Mother's Day, this is Mother's Day, and a lot of the wives are mothers, so husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And notice this, and gave himself for it. You know, he was willing to lay his life down. We read in John 10, 17, I lay my life down. And lo and behold, we find out he was willing to give himself for us, for the church, uh, which is the body of Christ. And this was planned in eternity past. The Godhead planned before the creation of the world that the, the body of Christ would be formed when it was formed. So, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ not only paid the price uh, for the sins of Israel there, but also for the Gentiles, for the sins of the world. He died and shed his blood on Calvary's cross that we could all be saved. And by, by saying that there, you know what? When you look at, you look at uh, love, and you think about and gave himself for it. That's, that's a good definition of love. Love's giving. It's not taking. It's not receiving. It's giving. It's what love is. That's a good definition of love. You know, Adam sacrificed himself for Eve. He was not deceived. She was. He knew when she was deceived and she took that uh, aid of that tree, she changed. Now, he saw that. Couldn't help but see it. And, but he wasn't uh, deceived. What Adam lost, you think about uh, Adam wanted to satisfy himself though. And to do that, he couldn't, he felt like he couldn't do without Eve. So he had to satisfy himself and you think about the rebellion or unbelief, the pride, you can use all that, and he, he ate, and he sinned. And that's when sin uh, comes in the world. But Ephesians 5, 25, talk about Christ and gave himself for it. Talking about the church. What Christ did, he went back with the sacrifice of himself. What Adam lost in the garden. That's what he did. He gave himself. That's why you have Romans 5, 8, but while we were yet, uh, the God meant His love toward us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And understanding that, Paul understood who he who he was. If you read First Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen, he is a blasphemer. I mean, he persecuted the, the Jewish churches. He did all he could against the world. Well, you think about Paul, what he was before salvation. Well, what were we before salvation? Sinners. That's all we were. Sinners. Hell-bound sinners uh, on our way to eternal hell. I talked to a man just this week and he said, I was 31 years old. He, went, he was in the Marines and he said, I was 31 years old when I was saved. But he said, I was a hell-bound sinner and uh, when I got saved, I was 21 and uh, then I talked to another family this week and they were saved. The husband and wife both were saved at early age. They were young when they, got, when they were saved. So you've got all ages being saved in this 
dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. Uh, you never get too old to be saved. And uh, either too young, either if, if a young person knows what the gospel is, Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised again, uh, they don't get too young either. But understand the gospel is free. And the gift's free, eternal life. And all we need to do, do is believe it and have eternal life. You know, after Paul got saved, his life changed. Now, you can read in Acts over there, and we'll turn to save time, but he counted his life to him after he was saved. Uh, he didn't count his life dear to him after he was saved because what he had had, he lost it. He, he was willing to give everything up for Christ. And that, that's something that's very important. Now, I've said all that to you. Go back to Ephesians, or Philippians. Chapter 1. In every chapter of the issue is Christ. I started out, when I started teaching this, every chapter of the issue is Christ. And Paul says in, in chapter 1, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So Christ is my life. Paul said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You look in chapter 2, and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, Christ is my mind, is what Paul is saying. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know, to, to know him more, uh, that's, that's another issue there. He, he's our goal. Uh, I want to know him more. And in chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He's my strength. He's my goal. Chapter 3, verse 10. He's my strength. In verse chapter 4, verse 13. And how's, how's Christ going to strengthen me? Well, He's given me His Bible, His Word, the complete Bible. This dispensation of grace, we're fortunate. We've got a complete Bible. Uh, all these years, 2,000 years, a complete Bible to go by. And we, we can read it. And by reading it and rightly dividing it and understanding the dispensation of grace, I can have to receive that strength in my inner man. So I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And that, that's what he's saying. So what is life to you as a believer? I've said all that to you to kind of introduce this. What is life to you as a believer? We're going to look at two things today. One is, what is life to you as a believer? To learn what God wants done. Now, it's just the opposite of what religion teaches today. These religious systems, they'll preach uh, salvation and a, a person gets saved, and automatically they'll say, well, you need to find out what God wants you to do. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that we need to learn what God wants done. Understand what God's plan and purpose is today in this dispensation of grace, which is the body of Christ. And the only way you can do that, you start reading the Bible and in a, in a grace church, then we all understand here, uh, we start out, anybody that comes and they'll say, well, I, I want to know what the truth is. Well, we start teaching them Romans through Philemon. That's where they need to start reading it, Romans through Philemon, and they read that. And they start studying those, those books. They understand that Paul is our apostle, Romans 11, 13. He's the apostle of the Gentiles. We understand about Paul, the mystery was revealed to him, the revelation of the mystery, Ephesians 3, Romans 16, 25. So, the mystery. And we understand that Paul laid the foundation. He was the first man to preach the gospel of grace. And the, the mystery was given to him. So, he laid the foundation for us. And we need to build on that foundation. And also, we understand that we're to, we're to follow Paul. And to follow Paul, it's Romans through Philemon. That's what we're going to follow and live by. And when you build up that doctrine in your inner man. And I say all that to you because of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Turn over there. This is a familiar verse to us. But 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul says, who will have all men to be saved, comma. That's the first thing. The gospel has got to be preached. Everybody, you give the gospel out, 
They need to know uh, where they're going to spend eternity, heaven or hell. So the gospel got to preach mm -hmm. the death, burial, and resurrection. After a person makes that choice to believe the gospel, then uh, they, need to, they need to do this and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the way they come out of the knowledge of the truth is we teach them what the Word of God says about follow it, about Paul's our apostle, just what I repeated just a minute ago. You go through that. And you want to teach them so they can come to the knowledge of the truth and have that knowledge of the truth like you do. Well, once they, you, they're taught, they have that knowledge of the truth, what are they going to do with it? Or are they just going to sit and look and never do anything with it? And the answer is no, that's not what we should be doing. And that's why we, we need to have our minds renewed today. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to come to the knowledge of the truth. But after you have the knowledge of the truth, you've come to it, what are you going to do with it? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, notice this, commit thy to faithful men. Well, who are the faithful men? Well, they're the ones that's been saved. They're the ones that you've taught. They've come to the knowledge of the truth. You commit that to faithful men. And who shall be able to teach others also? You, you've given it to them. They've been taught. I mean, they've been saved. You've taught these folks. Now, what are they going to do with it? They're going to give it out to somebody else. And like it says, or who shall be able to teach others also? We have to do that in our ministry. Every one of us. And that's why it's so important. Uh, we want to see people saved. And after they're saved, they're the ones that's easier to teach because they're ready to learn. And after they're taught the truth, then you commit the truth to them, then they're able to teach somebody else. So that, that's how it's just a change. And that's how it works. And, you know, whenever you come to the knowledge of the truth, you, then you develop in yourself discernment. And what is discernment? Well, discernment is to separate. You can do it by the eye or the understanding as well. You can distinguish to see the difference between two or more things. You discern, hey, the Word of God is true. Uh, we're to study it. Paul tells you in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study it. Show thyself approved. He tells you how to study it by rightly dividing. And by being able to rightly divide it, you can discern what's sound doctrine, what's not sound doctrine today. You can discern as you make choices in your life. You can discern and you've got, you can see things and you, you look at situations you might be in at work or wherever you're at and you, you, you look at it, you make an observation of it, you're not hasty about doing things and you look and you're praying about it and you're thinking about the Word of God as well and you're able to discern a lot better. You know, making decisions in your life. But doctrine-wise, we, we pick up. Somebody's not teaching sound doctrine. You listen to somebody, whether it's uh, on a, by a CD or a DVD or whatever. If they're not teaching sound doctrine, you know it. You pick it up. And you understand that's not right. So that's the sermon. And, and that's what we want to be. So what's life to you as a believer? What to learn what God wants done. And the way we do that, like I said, I've given you all that today, reading, reading and studying Apostle Paul and all that, and then you're able to discern. Life's a lot better when we can do that. And then the second thing, what is life to you as a believer? Well, it's to have a zeal to do the work of the ministry. That's what life is. We're in, we're in Philippians, and I'm not trying to get away from that because of the verse I said, for to me to live is Christ and die is gain. 1 Philippians 1.21. So to have a zeal to do the work of the ministry. And when I say zeal, we're talking about eagerness. We're talking about a, a desire to accomplish or obtain some, ob some object. And I, I can say this. When I first was saved, I had a zeal. I had an eagerness. I had a desire to tell everybody, uh, give the gospel out. And along as life goes on, it seems like we don't have that zeal like we'll have. And zeal, it could be, think about zeal, it could be a good zeal or a bad zeal. One way or the other. Good or bad. 
Let me give you an example. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Talking about zeal. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, Paul's writing, speaking, says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record. See, it's on record by Paul. I bear a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That's bad. That's a bad zeal. Verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, and have not submitted themselves in the righteousness of God. They're trying to do it their way instead of God's way. That's, that's a bad zeal right there. And that's what Israel had there. They had a bit bad zeal. Uh, they're trying to get righteous by their own works. And that will not work. Uh, verse 2 there, Paul could, have, Paul could have had, he could have said the same thing before he was saved there in verse 2. Five by record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Paul had a zeal of God. He had, he, Paul had zeal. And, but he, it was the wrong kind, the bad kind that Paul had. And that's, that's unfortunate. There's a lot of people out there in life that has that. I mean, Paul, he was zealous towards God. He had the tradition of, his, of the fathers. He was a Pharisee. He had all the zeal that anybody would want. You know, people on the outside, the ungodly would look at him and say, look what he's got. But anybody that's saved could discern and see that he was on the wrong side, which he was. He's a lost person. You know, here's a good, a good example of zeal, having zeal. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3. I think that we all should be concerned individually about our zeal, our eagerness, our desire to do you know, for the work of the ministry. Paul said in verse Colossians 4.13, For I bear him record, talking about Epaphras in verse 12, that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So here, here's one here. He had a great zeal uh, for the work of the ministry, for those, those saints right there. And you got to applaud a saint like that that's, that's, that's got that kind of zeal that wants to do uh, the work of the ministry. You know, when people get saved, like I mentioned a while ago, they, you, you creatures in Christ, person just been saved, they've got a zeal to do. They're willing to listen. They, they've got rid of their pride. And they've, been, they've humbled themselves and all that. They're not arrogant and high-minded, but they're just as calm and they're willing. Hey, I want to do it. I want to learn. And, and, and that, that type of thing. You know, the question is, what do we do as believers? Uh, what do we as believers need to do with young believers? That's, that's a good question. When, uh, when somebody, if they were coming to the assembly today and say a person got saved today, what are we going to do with that young believer? Are we going to go ahead the next breath and give them all the work in the, in the assembly here to do and just work, work, work? You know, that's, that's the way it works in, in religion today. And you know that. I can tell you, uh, when we were in, in the military, uh, and we were in Germany, and we were in this uh, Baptist church over there, and we had, what, two free nights a month? One free night a month. Uh, we were either in, in the services, doing visitation, uh, doing, doing work, and, and if you didn't work, you felt like, hey, you're going to be whipped and all this type of thing. You had that fear syndrome because of that, that's that law part of it, but not right the dividing word of truth. But uh, that's not helping you to edify. Just because you're busy, busy, busy and you want to do, you're not, that's not helping you in your edification. You've got a house to be built inside you once you're saved. And that's a house of doctrine. That's called an edification. You want to build up the foundation of Romans, the crosswork of Christ. You want the framework built in Ephesians telling you that you're a heavenly people. And you want the roof on that house to
to, t you, to say, I've got a blessed hope. I'm looking for that blessed hope. That's the doctrine that we want inside of us, and that's what everybody else needs. But you know, why do most assemblies, why do they, when a, a new convert say, why do most assemblies do this? Any thought behind that? I believe, a, I believe a good Bible answer would be this. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Ephesians 5, 14. And this is something I have to guard myself again with as well. Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he says, I wake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Now notice that what he, he says there in Ephesians there, in 5.14, Awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead. Now he's talking to believers. He's talking about believers being spiritually asleep. Not doing anything. Just sitting and they're asleep spiritually. Uh, they don't have that zeal. They're, they don't have that motivation. And they're not functioning. They're not bearing any fruit when you're like that. And I know, again, and we don't emphasize enough here, the first thing we need to do when we talk to people is get the gospel out to people. Hey, if they are saved, then the next thing is we want to teach them how to come to the knowledge of the truth. But we've got to get the word out. And we have to do that. We can't be asleep doing that. And I'm not trying to point and saying you are. I hope you're not. The only one that I can answer to myself today is, is as far as myself. You know, I can't, I'm not the policeman and I'm not your judge and this type of thing, but understand the danger of going to sleep and not having the motivation, the, the drive to do anything in, in the local assembly. So that, that's very important there. We need motivation. We need zeal. And if you, you've got that, or so, we need people that are like that. They'll come in and say they've, they've got motivation, they've got zeal. Well, what we've got to do is instruct them and teach them in the Word. Spend time with them and, and put the Word, the doctrine, in their inner man. And then they'll, they'll get the edification that they need. And once a person's edified, then guess what edification brings? Joy. You'll have joy uh, more than you ever thought about. I, I'm thankful for the joy that I have now <coughs> compared to what I had years back in traditional assemblies when they put me on the law system. I didn't have the joy, and I didn't have that peace. I didn't have that liberty that I have now, and that you have as well. And you know, the victory, we, we've got a privilege of being sons, that sonship that we have. That's a privilege to have that today. And knowing that our, I just talked to a family I met in the store yesterday, or Friday, talked to them an hour in the store. I mean, I gave the word. And after I got through it so weak, I couldn't hardly walk. But you've got to give it out to people and, and let them know how hey, they've lived in Christ and uh, understand the teaching. You think about the body of Christ. You know, all of us know 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. Well, what body is that? Verse 27 says it's the body of Christ. You know, Satan can't come into the body of Christ. Satan can't stop the body of Christ. Satan can't destroy the body of Christ. But what does Satan try to do to individual believers? He tries to trick us. How's he doing that? He, he wants to trick us how to not being who we are in Christ. That's what he wants you to do. If he can get you to the point, hey, you're not living and being who you should be in Christ, that's Satan's accomplished what he wants to do in your life. And mine. And that's what he does with believers. So going back to Philippians chapter 1, there in verse 21, Philippians 1, 21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the issue right there in Paul's life. Paul's thinking about his life. What's the issue in Paul's life? Verse 20, that Christ shall be magnified in my body. You see that in verse 20, Philippians 1, 20. Paul wants Christ magnified in his body. How does he want him magnified in his body? Look at the last part of that verse. Whether it be by life or death. 
You know, Christ is going to be magnified in Paul's body if he lives by life. Well, how could Christ be magnified in his body by death? Well, Paul's going to be with him. It doesn't matter by life or by, by death. Let me give you this verse real quick. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. <clears throat> this is a real important verse to us. Verse 20. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, look here. Nevertheless, I live. See that? I live. Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's His faithfulness. That's His trustworthiness. Who loved me and gave Himself for me. His life in me, living out through me. That's what Paul wanted. He wanted his life in me, living out through me. And that's for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain.